A new early study by researchers at the Los Alamos National Laboratory shows that the coronavirus may be mutating and that the new dominant strain appears to be even more contagious than the original strain. Joining us right now to talk about this and much more is Dr. Scott Gottlieb. He is former FDA commissioner. He's also a CNBC contributor and serves on the boards of both Illumina and Pfizer. And Dr. Gottlieb, you and I went back and forth a little bit yesterday about this. I, I was concerned reading on this, uh, and you actually made me feel a little bit better. What, what, what are your thoughts on what we're hearing about this mutation at this point? Well, it's a computational analysis that shows that the dominant strain in Europe and subsequently in the United States was this strain that had a single base pair chain in, change in the sequence. Um, a single amino acid got changed out. And they suggest that because this became the dominant strain based on their computational analysis, it must be more contagious. We saw a change like this with Ebola, and we initially thought that it also made Ebola more contagious. And we actually had cell culture data to support it at that time. And we found that when we put it into animal studies, in fact, the change in the virus didn't change its um, contours at all, didn't make it more infectious. Here we just have the computational analysis. We don't have any other data to support it, including cell culture data. And it could be what we call founder's effect. It could just be that this strain with this single base pair chain change is what got into Europe and then Europe subsequently seeded the United States. And so the analysis could be confounded by the fact that this just became the dominant strain in Europe because it got into Europe early and then got into the United States from Europe. So it really doesn't prove anything. It doesn't prove that this new strain is, in fact, more infectious, which is what they concluded. You know, it does raise the question, though, about mutations and, and whether or not a vaccine would be able to stop it entirely. You, you think about the flu vaccine. It doesn't always work. There are a lot of different strains, and we're never entirely sure which strain is going to be uh, the most common strain that goes around any given flu season. Is, is, is that a concern with this, or do you think that that's less likely to happen? Not as much as a, of a concern as it is with flu, because the spike protein, what we've seen is it's relatively stable. It undergoes changes. So there have been mutations in this virus as it's spread around the world. But the spike protein itself and the characteristics of it that the vaccines would target are relatively stable. Now, that said, you probably would want to change the vaccine every year or two, every couple of years, maybe every two or three years, because there is going to be drift. But you probably wouldn't see the kind of changes within a season that would obviate a vaccine with this particular virus. Yeah, that's that's the protein that that gets into the or that, that latches to something on the cell that uh, of the right. host that, that allows it to get in. So, yeah, that, that when we spoke to the, uh, the, the lead researcher at Pfizer, that's the one that they're using or, or uh, I guess there's a, maybe a couple of proteins. Scott, when I read that headline, like so many headlines that I read on, on some of these sites like Drudge or whatever, they made it sound like the, that the, the mutated strain was new and it was going to be more infectious from here on out. But the strain we have is different than the original strain in China, which made it more contagious. This is what we're already dealing with, right? They, they failed to point that out in the, with, with the clickbait headline on drugs. Right. Well, look, there's a lot of different strains circulating. This, this virus has undergone genetic drift. Just because it mutates doesn't mean it's changing in ways that's going to make it more virulent or more infectious, more dangerous or more infectious. It is going to drift over time. Um, generally, the drift should be in the direction of making it less, less, in, less right, virulent, right. less dangerous, not right. more, if it's selected for, because it wants to keep its host alive. But just because it's changing doesn't mean it's changing in ways that's making it worse right. or it, better. It, it, um, but it is changing. It usually there's goes There's two the different other strains way. that predominate. It, it, it usually goes the other right. way. And, and right. there's, there's hope for that. So right. there's also a piece that said, if you catch coronavirus, it will cut 13 years off your life. And that makes the way that that's written makes it sound like even if you live, you will live. But all that was doing was averaging the age of people that got it that unfortunately pass away and what they would have been expected to live to. But they totally I mean, there's so much out in, in the in the media right now, uh, Scott, that, that just is inflammatory and incendiary and sensationalistic that you really need to read between the lines on, on all this stuff, even stuff that you're quoted on all the time. You got, you're, probably I, more, you're probably scared to say anything uh, at this point, right? <laughs> I, see, I see myself misquoted as well. And you're like, Look, the headline the coming out of that... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the headline coming out of that Los Alamos study yesterday was, was very misleading. The, study, exactly. the reports that were done in some of the newspaper press were misleading. They, con they concluded far too much from that study than what the study actually showed. Right. Andrew. I just wanted to understand, uh, when we were talking earlier about the different strains, 
how this works when it comes to the vaccines, how it works when it comes to therapeutics. You know, you're going down one path to try to to try to solve one piece of, piece of it. You know, how complicated is if how complicated is it if it mutates? Yeah, generally with drugs or with a vaccine, you're trying to target parts of the um, virus that are preserved that don't undergo mutations in ways that would obviate um, the machinery in a fashion that would uh, thwart whatever your drug is trying to do or what the vaccine is trying to do. So with the drugs, you're targeting aspects of viral replication that really don't change all that much. And we have a lot of drugs targeting viruses that are relatively stable over time. The viruses don't learn how to, how to thwart them. Mm -hmm over short periods of time. And with the vaccine, you're targeting the spike protein. Or with the antibody drugs, you're targeting that spike protein. And what we've seen in the sequence data is, yes, the spike protein does undergo changes, genetic changes, but not enough to, uh, to thwart a vaccine or an antibody drug within the c confines of a single season, as we sometimes see with the flu vaccine. So it doesn't mutate that rapidly. So if we had a vaccine for coronavirus, that was targeting the spike protein, probably we'd want to re-engineer the vaccine every two or three years to be safe. But you wouldn't need to re-engineer it probably within the confines of a single season. It should be relatively stable. So we should be able to target this virus. And this, this study that came out doesn't suggest otherwise. Okay, good. I think we're... Andrew, you had another question? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I, I Andrew? Andrew oh, yeah, I, I, had just, I had just one other question that, okay. unrelated to this, but it was something that we were talking about with Eunice Yoon earlier about PPE and, and how much PPE we still need and how much of that uh, we are getting or need to get from China. And just wanted to get your thoughts on that because clearly tensions are rising between the U.S. and China given the back and forth rhetoric and, and what that all means. We're still dependent upon China for a lot of that, but we've all opened up alternative sources, including domestic sources for that. And what I hear anecdotally is that hospitals are restocking and the federal government's restocking. So hopefully, you know, if this does end up being a slow simmer of infection through the summer and we face some risks in the fall, hopefully by the fall we'll, we'll have restocked. I mean, we're, we're focused on this problem now. Everyone's aware of it. So they're opening up alternative supply routes for PPE and getting it into the hospitals. Obviously, New York's depleted, but other hospitals have been able to stock up and are in relatively good shape, hospitals in parts of the country that haven't been hard hit.